Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast. Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Kentrosaurus, and we have some dinosaur news. And just wanted to say thanks to our Patreon supporters. We have a special treat this week. We posted a little preview audio clip of our upcoming book, Top 10 Dinosaurs of 2015. You might recall that Brad Jost of the Jurassic Park podcast posted a clip of him reading our Dakota Raptor or part of the Dakota Raptor scene. And we have another one now for Genuine Long. So visit our Patreon page and check it out. And that post is accessible to everyone, and our page is at patreon.com slash inodino. New and improved. <laughs> yes. So first in the news is an article published in the journal PLOS One titled, A New Basal Hadrosauroid Dinosaur from the Lower Cretaceous Cockcrot Formation in Nakhon Ratkazama province of northeastern Thailand. And I'm, I apologize if I mispronounced some or all of that. Thai is a hard language. Yeah. So it's a new dinosaur, as the title says, and the first bones were found in 2005 by the Japan Thailand Dinosaur Project, which sounds like a fun group. Officially, it's a collaboration between the Northeastern Research Institute of Petrified Woods and Mineral Resources from Nakhon Ratkazama Rajabat University and paleontologists from Japan's Fukui Prefecture Dinosaur Museum. It's kind of a mouthful. That's probably why they came up with Japan Thailand Dinosaur Project. That is pretty catchy. Yeah. And we've talked about the Fukui Prefecture Dinosaur Museum before and how awesome it is with their animatronics and how we want to go there. For about the next five years after the initial discovery in 2005, they excavated bones in that Kokrat Formation, which is about 100 miles northeast of Bangkok. It was named in honor of the Thai princess Surindhorn, who turned 60 in 2015, and it was named after her because she was a big supporter of paleontology in Thailand. The species name comes from the province in which it was found. So the full name ends up being Surindhorna coratensis. They found a lot of pieces of the skull and jaw of this dinosaur, and not surprisingly it has leaf-shaped teeth, which would have been good for eating plants. We always hear about that with the hadrosauroids. Many other fossils have been found in Thailand, but there haven't been too many dinosaurs, and this is the first iguanodon to be found there. And according to the article, it's the, quote, first report of well-preserved ornithopod skull in Southeast Asia, end quote. The specimen is estimated to be from the early Cretaceous about 120 million years ago, making it the oldest, or technically speaking, the most basal hadrosauroid. It's estimated that Syrintorna coratensis was about 2 meters, or 6.5 feet tall, and about 6 meters, or 19 and a half feet long. The dinosaur was on display briefly in Japan at the Fukui Prefecture Dinosaur Museum until the end of January, according to the Japan Times. I'm not sure where it is now. I couldn't find anything. It's probably back in Thailand. Next in the news, smaller tyrannosaurs related to T-Rex were recently found on the border between Idaho and Wyoming, and now they'll be housed at the Idaho State Museum of Natural History, where they'll be studied. Scientists actually found three types of theropods, all smaller than T-Rex, and this is based on their teeth. They think that they were between the size of a horse to the size of a retriever dog. Researchers also found a pair of oviraptorosaur eggs in the area, which is the first evidence that oviraptorosaurs lived in that area. So, another reason for us to go to Idaho. Yep. Neither of us have been there yet. Yep. In another part of the world, in Morocco, scientists have found large bones and footprints of both herbivorous and carnivorous dinosaurs. The tracks were spread over dozens of meters. Not much is known about them yet, but the area has been recently urging locals to help preserve fossils, which the team attributes to helping them find more of these fossils. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so it's working out. Yeah. And in Gujarat, in India, a team of Indian and German geologists have found dinosaur fossils either the hip or limb bones, and teeth and jaw bones. Not much is known yet about these bones either, but they think it may be the oldest fossil found so far this century. 
which since we're coming into year 16, I don't know how much that says, but pretty interesting. Yeah, well, we have talked about a couple really old dinosaurs, so that would be pretty cool. Yeah. This dinosaur may have been about 33 to 49 feet or 10 to 15 meters long. Hmm. Yeah, without having, if you're just judging from teeth and jaw and hip bones, it's pretty hard to tell how long they would be. Makes sense that they have such a big range. Yeah. We had at least one, maybe skeptic, fan on Facebook who uh, said, yeah, it's probably not quite the oldest, so we'll see. Maybe they mean oldest found in the area, too. Yeah, that could be a little bit lost in translation or something. Usually they get a pretty good guess based on the formation, and we don't hear too many dinosaurs coming out of India, so I'm not sure how well-known the site they found it in is and how knowledgeable they are about when that strata of rock is from. Yeah, I think in that area, though, there's been a number of finds before. Hmm. I don't remember all the details, but... It... Yeah, it's kind of surprising then that they would guess that it's older. But yeah. we'll see. Let the peer reviews decide. <laughs> Next in the news is a really fun article from Drexel titled How to Build a Flexing Robotic Dinosaur Limb in Seven Quote-Unquote Easy Steps. And they even reference the fact that they're maybe not that easy. In the article, as you'd expect, they break the process down into seven steps. The first is find a massive, amazingly complete dinosaur skeleton, because they're specifically talking about when they found Dreadnoughtus and how, starting two years ago, they started figuring out how the dinosaur moved and using some new techniques to figure it out. Easy step number one. Yeah, that's obviously by far the hardest thing since there are so few of those. Good that thing have you been get discovered. it over with so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> the second step is 3D scan the bones. And they say that the process of 3D scanning all of these bones took 600 hours and that there were 145 bones in all. And all of the virtual models of these bones are available to download now. Oh, good. Piece of cake, step number two, compared to step number one. Yes. <laughs> the third step is build a digital model, and I thought that was kind of a weird title for it since 3D scanning is building the digital models, but really what they're talking about is figuring out the muscle attachment points and comparing it to a reference species to arrange the modeled bones in the most likely arrangement. So... We're pretty deep into the computer part of it at this point. Just a little technical knowledge. <laughs> the fourth step is 3D print the limb bones. And they said it took only about 12 hours to print a one-tenth scale replica of a four-limb bone, which was about six inches long. I'm guessing that was probably the humerus, but they didn't specify. They also added a few attachment points in this process so that their replica ligaments would have somewhere to attach later. Since they basically end up using rubber bands, you know, they had to have little posts with a nub at the end so that the rubber bands had something to hold on to. The fifth step is what they call 3D printing the joints, but really what they 3D printed was a mold with a cavity for the likely shape of cartilage and the cartilage pad that would have fit between the bones. So if you think of like the meniscus in a human knee, that we assume the dinosaurs had the same kind of thing, because otherwise the bones would have been wearing down, rubbing against one another. So they get an expert to figure out what kind of cartilage might have been there, and then print it out, made it out of silicone. Number six is titled, Some Assembly Required. <laughs> and that's where they connect all the ligaments and put the forelimb into a custom-designed machine, which it reminds me of like a marionette, because there's a bunch of strings that stick up off of all these ligaments, or these simulated ligaments, and it spools in the ligament fiber and then unspools it to simulate flexing and unflexing a muscle. So, pretty cool. And then step seven is time to flex. So that's when they go to the computer, and they control the muscle movements, and they can then even compare the motion of the modeled forelimb to what they might have expected in the beginning in a separate computer simulation. 
So it's a pretty cool way to do it. I've seen lots of these computer simulations where they model movement that way, but this is the first time I've seen one where they actually 3D printed something and then put it in this marionette-like thing to test how it might have moved. Pretty cool. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Thanks to Cesar for this one, there was an article in the UK Biochemical Society magazine called Jurassic World, Just How Impossible Is It? It addresses how DNA molecules do not last long enough to allow us to recreate dinosaurs. DNA in any sample will be gone in 6.8 million years, so obviously not long enough since dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. And it goes on a hypothetical, though, about what would happen if we were able to isolate dinosaur DNA. Most likely, they would look very similar to birds, and the difference will come in depending on when certain genes are active. But to figure out where and when genes are expressed is hard to determine. And once scientists figure that out, as well as the number of genes required to make an organism, then theoretically you could create a dinosaur. The article goes on to speculate about Indominus rex from Jurassic World, which was, as we all know, modified to be able to camouflage itself and hide from thermal technology based on cuttlefish and frog genes. And while transgenic technology has been around for a while, how you modify an organism varies depending on the organism and the genes you want to use. So long story short, the whole idea of creating a dinosaur from DNA and or modifying it is a complicated experimental process. Yeah, definitely. And they brought up something that I'm not sure if we've talked about specifically on the show before, but the idea that even if you had all the DNA, you wouldn't know which genes were being expressed. And that's because there's things in the DNA that actually structure how it's shaped. And the way I've always heard it described is you can think of it as like a spool. And if you wrap the DNA tightly around the spool, it doesn't get expressed. And you can inherit some of those traits, even though they aren't specifically genes. It does affect which genes are being expressed, which ones are available. So if you had this piece of dinosaur DNA that somehow survived all this time, if those spools had degraded or it wasn't exactly clear which part was spooled up or otherwise deactivated, you wouldn't end up with the dinosaur that you expected. And a lot of the stuff that's in human DNA, if you started activating this stuff, who knows what you'd end up with. We might get gills or something hmm. because, you know, we have all these common ancestors and if you express these genes of ancestors that have been deactivated it's a crapshoot so just another reason it's really hard to make a dinosaur <laughs> yep next in the news is an article that i really enjoy because i talk about vr on almost every <laughs> in almost every episode it seems like this one is a viewmaster dlx vr headset vr being virtual reality and it was announced at the new york toy fair a few days ago and more importantly than the actual new Viewmaster kit is a dinosaur experience pack, which is going to be created in conjunction with National Geographic, and they tend to do a pretty good job with their dinosaur stuff. And it's also going to include a survival adventure game and interactive dinosaur skeletons, which sounds pretty awesome. It's supposed to be $15, and I'm assuming the game will work with the current Viewmaster VR kit, and in case you're not familiar, there's a thing right now called the Viewmaster VR Kit. And it's based on the Google Cardboard platform. You might have seen that at some point. You basically put your smartphone into a device, basically just a holder with a couple lenses on it. And you put it up to your face and it makes it kind of look like you're there. And Viewmaster obviously has been doing this for a long time with lenses and pictures and all that kind of stuff. So what they did is they started selling these Google Cardboard-like devices, and then they sell something that looks like one of those old-fashioned slide wheels that you used to put into the Viewmaster headsets. But in this case, it's got something on it so that when you look at it with the VR headset, something pops up out of it. So if you're looking at like the space version, you look at it and you see a little spaceship, and then you can click a button and then you go into the spaceship virtual reality. So it's really just their way of getting you into the VR experience with just this little disc thing that you look at. Hmm. The new DLX version has a few improvements over the current model, including it has a headphone connector. On the current one, you have to use your phone speakers, although I think if you have Bluetooth headphones, that would work. Focal adjustments, so you can possibly use it without glasses. 
improved optics. I don't know what that is, but hopefully, you know, clearer pictures or something. And it has a new smartphone mount so that you can use it with smaller phones like the iPhone 5, which didn't fit in the original one. They also say that they fixed a problem with a latch on the device so that it no longer falls open when you're not expecting it, which would be pretty jarring if you're in a VR experience and all of a sudden you're, you know, just staring into the room. The only thing that is possibly missing is a head strap, but they said that this was intentional to stop children from using it for really long periods of time because no one's really sure about the health effects of it and obviously they don't want to be the ones to find out. The current model costs $20 if you can find it on sale, and I checked and it's $20 most places. And the new model is supposed to come out at $40 this fall, so I might just pick up a $20 one to try it. Especially if this dinosaur experience thing comes out for it. Yeah, would be cool. Yeah. And speaking of kids, in the UK, there was a group of kids in primary school that found out on Monday morning that their school had dinosaur eggs. The eggs were in the playground, and the discovery has inspired the kids to research dinosaurs and write dinosaur stories. Here's a few quotes from the kids from the article. Quote, when I was sleeping in the middle of the night, I think I heard Triceratops stomping in the playground. And I went to the museum yesterday, and I saw a pterodactyl egg, and it was the same color and size as ours. So it's pretty cute and also pretty great that it can be this discovery can be so inspiring and I hope it continues to inspire the kids well past this week. Yeah. When I was reading the article, I couldn't quite tell if it was a real discovery or if they staged it to get the kids excited about science. I Could got the impression that it was a real discovery and then they used that as a teachable moment. Okay. Because I couldn't find any other sources either, which I thought was kind of unusual for dinosaur eggs, but... Maybe. Seems like a lot to get a police car to come in and shut down the area. Yeah. Because they said that that's how they were greeted Monday morning, the police car with I the lights that. flashing. But that also seems weird, too. I've never heard of a police car being at a dig site. True. But who knows? But how many dig sites have we heard were in a playground? Yeah, you get them in parking lots and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It also seems a little bit too perfect. Like, who was digging in the playground and discovered dinosaur eggs? You never know. Seems weird. Maybe we'll find out more later. I'd like to think it was real. Yeah. You're the optimist. <laughs> also in the UK, this time in Godshill, some pranksters moved a replica Triceratops to the middle of the road on Friday night. The Triceratops is nicknamed Godshilla, and it caused some traffic. Although, this was going on at 3 a.m., so probably not too, too bad of traffic. A number of people tweeted about Godzilla with photos to show the dinosaur or kind of, quote-unquote, crossing the road. <laughs> it, at least in the photos, it looks like it's mid-cross. One person tweeted, quote, that priceless moment when you're driving home from work at 3 a.m. and the road is blocked by a 20-foot triceratops. Hashtag, God bless beer. Hashtag, someone needs a medal. <laughs> And there's been some follow-up stories, as you can imagine, about this. And people are saying, well, it was probably at least five people who had a few beers because that replica is apparently pretty hefty and would have been hard to move. <laughs> That's funny. And just before we leave the news segment, I want to give a shout-out to our listener, Vince, who sent us an email asking us for a poster recommendation and I sent him an email with the details, but I want to share it with everybody in case somebody else is wondering about this. So my favorite dinosaur poster isn't really specifically dinosaur related, and that's partly because a lot of dinosaur posters are geared towards children and have some outdated information, and even ones that are accurate right now a lot of times are very specific to assumptions that are being made that get outdated quickly and most of them don't have feathers, just a myriad of things that kind of bug me a little bit. <laughs> so my favorite poster is incredibly technical, and it's called The Correlated History of Earth. And it was last updated in 2013. It's the eighth edition. We found this poster when we were at the Black Hills Institute in South Dakota, and... In 2013. Yeah, yeah, it must have been brand new when we got it. We were talking in depth with one of the people who worked there, and he said, you have to get this poster because it has so much information on it, it's really popular. 
And I looked at it, and it is awesome. On one side, it's got all of the continental drift throughout Earth's history. And next to that, it has all of the epochs and ages. So if you're wondering, like, you know, what does late Jurassic mean in terms of years ago, you can easily look at it and see it in a moment. And it's got information about all the craters and volcano eruptions. The biggest part of the poster, though, is a timeline of evolution. So it starts with prokaryotes and archaea a really long time ago, and then it shows how they evolved eventually into things like reptiles, which includes dinosaurs, and then even eventually mammals. And the time scale is squished so that the really old stuff doesn't have much in it, but there's a lot on the dinosaurs, and it shows key dinosaur groups, like this is when the hadrosaurs showed up, and this is when stegosaurus showed up, and stuff like that. It's really cool. I love the poster. I look at it all the time. It's super useful. And there's a version of it that's foldable. And on the other side of it, it has tons of information about the periodic table of elements called the history of matter. And the other side has just this correlated history of Earth. I bought a laminated version of the correlated history of Earth because it's the one that I'm super interested in. There are two sites that sell it. I've had a bunch of difficulty with the checkout process on one of the sites, so I can't really recommend that. The other place that sells the current edition is the Black Hills Institute, where we bought it, actually, and the shipping is a little bit expensive, so you might be tempted to look elsewhere, and you might find it elsewhere, but most of the ones I was looking at on other sites were much older editions, so if you want to find it, make sure that it's the 8th edition, because a lot of people are still selling like the 3rd edition, and that's obviously missing a lot of information. So thanks again, Vince, for reaching out. Something I had been thinking about talking about on the show, so thanks for giving me the opportunity. And we'll post the links to the two places that I've seen the current edition on our site. And last, before we dive into the dinosaur of the day, I want to mention that we have teamed up with Everything Dinosaurs Weebly for a special book giveaway that will be happening starting Monday. We'll post this on our blog and share it with our social media accounts, but just so you know, it's a giveaway that will be running for two weeks, and you'll have the chance to win a book called The Dinosaur Lords. It's a pretty cool looking book. It actually has a quote from George R. R. Martin on it that says it's Game of Thrones meets dinosaurs or something like that. Something like that. It sounds interesting. It's about eight creators who use dinosaurs as weapons as they kind of play out these games of passion and power, like in Game of Thrones. And then in the book description, it says the enigmatic mercenary dinosaur lord Carl Bogomirsky is defeated through betrayal and left for dead. He wakes naked, wounded, partially amnesic, and hunted and embarks upon a journey that will shake his world. So again, this giveaway will be lasting two weeks, starting on Monday, February 22nd, until March 4th, that's a Friday. And you have many chances to enter, including visiting Everything Dinosaurs on Google, following us on Twitter, tweeting, and through Facebook. So we're happy to do this. We like collaborating with Taylor McCoy from Everything Dinosaurs. He's got a great site and a very active, wonderful community on Google+, so we recommend you check it out. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Kentrosaurus, whose name means prickle lizard. And Kentrosaurus was requested from Cole, our patron, so thanks, Cole. Kentrosaurus was a close relative of Stegosaurus, and it was described by Edwin Hennig in 1915. Fossils were found in the Tendigaroo Formation. No complete skeletons were found, but hundreds of bones were found on German expeditions into German East Africa from 1909 to 1912. And so the first Kentrosaurus fossil was found in 1909, and Werner Janitz said in 1910 that it was a type of Stegosaur. Over 1,200 bones were found from 50 individuals. Many were destroyed during World War II, though, sadly. There's 350 specimens, though, at the Museum of Natural History in Berlin. Though multiple specimens were found, they did not die a mass death at the same time, so they don't represent a single herd, and that makes it hard to guess about their behaviors. The type species is Kentrosaurus aethiopicus, and the species name aethiopicus comes from the provenance from Africa. Hennig did not designate a holotype in his original description, but he picked the most complete partial skeleton for his monography in 1925, which is now part of the mounted skeleton in Berlin. Hennig published his monography in 1925, but by then only one tooth had been found, and later more tooth fragments were found in a tooth-bearing bone from the lower jaw. It was very similar to Stegosaurus, but smaller. 
there's controversy over the name. The name is similar to the Ceratopsian Centrosaurus. And in 1916, Hennig renamed Kentrosaurus to Kentrurosaurus, which means pointed tail saurian. And then Franz Nopska from Hungary renamed the Ceratopsian Centrosaurus to Dorifosaurus, which means lance-bearing saurian. But it turns out this renaming wasn't necessary because the spellings and pronunciations are different, so Kentrosaurus is still valid. And now Kentrurosaurus is considered a junior synonym. And we always call it Centrosaurus, too. We never talk about... Dorifosaurus. Yeah. In 1993, George Olszewski classified fossils of Stegosaurus longispinus, which was named by Charles Gilmore in 1914, as Kentrosaurus longispinus. But paleontologists did not accept this, and it became its own genus, Natronsaurus, which has longer tail spikes than Kentrosaurus and a slightly different pelvis and vertebrae structure. So again, Kentrosaurus was similar to, but smaller than Stegosaurus. An adult Kentrosaurus was on average about half the length of an adult Stegosaurus. In 2011, Mallison described the difference between Kentrosaurus and other dinosaurs in the Stegosauria group, and included the neural spines in the tail being vertical in the middle of the tail and having a hooked shape in the back of the tail. Kentrosaurus had elongated spikes. One specimen had a bone core length of 731 millimeters. Oof, that's 2.4 feet. So pretty huge spike. Mm Mm-hmm. And spikes and plates were probably covered. Stegosaurus only had one row of plates and two rows of spikes on its tail end. Kentrosaurus had thinner spikes than Stegosaurus. They were more likely to bend. Ragno Redelstorff said in a 2013 study that based on bone histology, Kentrosaurus had a higher growth rate than Stegosaurus, though it was smaller and contradicts the idea that larger dinosaurs grew more quickly than smaller dinosaurs. Kentrosaurus had shoulder spikes, which were originally thought to be on its hips, until some Chinese stegosaurs were found. And these similar shoulder spikes you can find on the stegosaurs Gigantspinosaurus and Huyangosaurus. Kentrosaurus lived in the late Jurassic in Tanzania, or in what is now Tanzania. It lived in a subtropical to tropical area with seasonal rains and dry periods. Other dinosaurs in the area included Giraffa Titan, Barosaurus, Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, and Elaphrosaurus. Kentrosaurus was about 15 feet or 4.5 meters long and weighed one ton. It had hoof-like claws on its toes and a small elongated head. It had a small brain about the size of a walnut, but it had a good sense of smell. Scientists found enough Kentrosaurus brain cavities to gather data on its intelligence and sense of smell. Kentrosaurus probably had two rows of small plates on its neck and back and spikes on the hip and tail, and the longest ones were on the tail. The plates were not much protection, they were more for display. Again, it had these long spikes on each shoulder. It may have used its spikes for defense. It also had a muscular tail. And it was a large tail. More than half of its length is the tail. Because of its center of mass, not much weight is supported by the front legs, which means that Kentrosaurus had a tight turning radius. Mm. Heinrich Mallison created a digital skeleton model of Kentrosaurus in 2005 to study its range of motion and found that it had a flexible neck. Mallison also made models of Kentrosaurus' tail. The tail had at least 40 caudal vertebrae, which means it was very mobile, could swing at a 180 degree arc at potentially up to 31 miles per hour or 50 kilometers per hour, and rapid swings could have slashed through skin or broken bones, and direct blows with the tail spikes would fracture bones. This would have really hurt small and medium theropods and potentially hurt large theropods. Yeah. At this speed, Mallison wrote, quote, the spikes could penetrate deeply into soft tissues or between ribs and were able to shatter bones. He adds, quote, penetrating impacts at 10 meters per second created forces greater than those sufficient to fracture a human skull, end quote. That sounds almost like a mace, that medieval ball with spikes on it or something like that. Yeah. Jeez. (laughs) Based on recent computer models of stegosaurs, Kentrosaurs probably had better posture than normally depicted. There's no horizontal neck or neck sloping down, but rather would have had a neck angled upwards and its head held a little higher than its back. Kentrosaurus could quickly rotate around the hips and keep the tail pointed at a predator, though a fast predator could still get to the tail base, which wouldn't have hurt as much when it swung its tail, and then would have, could have attacked Kentrosaurus's unprotected neck and upper body. But in order to kill a Kentrosaurus, it may have required hunting in packs. Because Kentrosaurus had a flexible neck, it could look over its back, so it could possibly throw its head back to keep looking at an attacker. If Kentrosaurus was a herding animal, working together with multiple tails would have helped keep them safe from predators. 
One early interpretation of how Kentrosaurus defended itself was to charge through attackers with its spines, similar to modern porcupines. When walking, Kentrosaurus had an upright posture but sprawled in defense, so it may have sprawled when defending itself. It had short forelimbs and long hind limbs, and Kentrosaurus also showed sexual dimorphism. It seems that there may have been more females than males, at least that we know of so far. There's two types of thigh bones, and one, which I think is the female type, had larger, more stout thigh bones than the other, so females probably had the thicker thigh bones. Kentrosaurus was an herbivore, and it mostly swallowed its food in large chunks. It had a beak that could bite off plant material. It was considered to be a low browser for food, but could rear up to get some vegetation. On all fours, it could eat food that was up to 5 feet 7 inches, or 1.7 meters high, but it could also rear up on its hind legs to reach higher vegetation. Because of its long tail, its center of mass was close to its hind limbs, so it could potentially support itself in a stand-up position, and the tail would have either been fully lifted or used as a third leg, though Bob Bakker said that he thinks the tail wasn't stiff enough to be a third leg. Standing up, Kentrosaurus could have reached food as high as 11 feet or 3.3 meters. Pretty good. Yeah. You can see a composite skeletal mount of Kentrosaurus in the Natural History Museum in Berlin, Germany. The mount in Berlin is comprised of a nearly complete tail, hip, dorsal vertebrae, and parts of limbs from one individual. The mount was dismantled in 2006 to 2007 and remounted with an improved pose. The brain case and spine and other parts are thought to have been lost in World War II, but then were actually later found in a drawer of a basement cupboard. So, good news. Mm -hmm. The Museum of the Institute for Geosciences of the Erberhard Karls University, Tübingen, has a composite mount with about 50% original Kentrosaurus bones. Kentrosaurus belongs to the group Threophora, also called Enoplosauria, which is a group of dinosaurs with dermal armor and includes stegosaurs and ankylosaurs. Speaking of stegosaurs and how they had shorter front limbs and longer rear limbs, I wonder if it could swim like how Stegosaurus might have been able to. Maybe. Hard to know. Yeah. Be hard to find those tracks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Stegosauridae is a family of Theropthoran dinosaurs, and this includes Stegosaurus more closely related to Stegosaurus than Huayangosaurus, which is again the Chinese Stegosaur with the shoulder spikes. Stegosauridae lived into the late Cretaceous. They had rows or osteoderms along their neck, trunk, and tail. The plates and spikes were used for either display, thermal regulation, or defense. Their front legs were shorter than their rear legs, and they were powerful but slow. They could shear small branches. Their skulls are shallower than early stegosaurs, and they have two subfamilies, Decentrurinae and Stegosaurinae, and Stegosaurinae are larger. And our fun fact of the day comes from something Sabrina just mentioned, that Thyreophorans have osteoderms, and they had some of the most extensive examples, especially with ankylosaurs being in that group. But many other dinosaurs and other animals also have osteoderms, and that includes crocodilians, some marine species, and armadillos. Armadillos have a pretty unique one, too, that they can ball up and have that mm -hmm. all over their body. But according to the Nature article titled Sauropod Dinosaur Osteoderms from the Late Cretaceous of Madagascar, the biggest known animals ever to have osteoderms were titanosaurs. And in fact, they had the biggest osteoderms ever discovered. Specifically, they describe a single osteoderm found in Madagascar about the size of an American football with an estimated volume of about 10 liters, which is the most massive osteoderm ever to be discovered. It's huge. Yeah. To, to imagine that that was basically grown just within skin, like a huge <laughs> callus or something, is Ooh. amazing. You think be, of it that way. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be quite a defensive move to have those all over your body. Indeed. It's hard to tell how extensive they were on the titanosaurs. Usually in the pictures I see of them, they kind of just have a few spots on their back, but it's hard to say. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. If you like what you hear, then please consider supporting us. We're on Patreon at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. We're planning on posting more goodies more often, so keep an eye out for that. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at 
iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.